Hi there and welcome to the Dublin Vineyard Sunday service. We're meeting every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. and 8 p.m. online. Our kids already met this morning at 9.30 for their program. My name is Johnny and I want to welcome everyone, whether you're watching us live now at dublinvineyard.online.church or you're catching us later on YouTube, we want to thank you for taking the time to connect with us and we really hope this experience is meaningful for you. Please write any comments you have in the chat section, tell us where you're watching us from, or if you have any questions or prayer requests. So here's what's gonna to happen today. Uh, we'll start with a time of worship led by our band. Then it's time to meet another new baby from our church community. Stay tuned to see who it's gonna be. Then our series continues called Living in the Kingdom of God, a life beyond human explanation. As Sean answers the question, what is grace? That will be followed by communion together. So I invite you to get a, a piece of bread and wine or juice, have it ready uh, or whatever you want to use for this time. Another worship song will then help us respond before our time together comes to an end. So Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. May this be a time where we connect with you. May our ears be open to hear you speak and our eyes to see what you're doing. We pray a blessing over everyone who's watching us right now. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Hi everyone, my name is David. This is Amanda. <laughs> this is Alicia. Uh, she was born 24 May this year and we've been attending the Living Year since 2018. <laughs> so our turning point this year is really related to her arrival and we've been trying to get pregnant for around eight years and it was not happening. We had many medical support in Brazil and then here we were not having anyone and she came and it was a miracle. And in her first scan, the doctor found a problem and he said she would not be a healthy baby. She would have chromosomal disease or internal abnormalities and it was a really hard time for us. So. God was really present, He was faithful, and we could experience His goodness. Uh, he brought us people who supported us in many ways. I could say emotionally, people who cried our pain. I could say spiritually, uh, people who prayed for us and shared the, God's word with us. And people who also supported us financially, um, paying for exams. So, uh, God's really good and at the end she came completely healthy and we are so grateful for this beautiful gift that God gave us. <laughs> Your thumb. Is it good? Is it good? Hi, I'm Sean and I'm part of Dublin Vineyard which is part of the amazing tapestry which is God's church and we get to be a, a unique thread in that tapestry of God's church we are Dublin Vineyard people who are on a journey of encountering Jesus in a way that he's changing us from the inside out and you're really welcome to join us if it's your first time or you're a member of our community now we're in week two of a series called Living in the Kingdom of God, A Life Beyond Human Explanation. And we saw that last week, God's people were a people who were always to live their lives by the power of God. In other words, lives beyond human explanation. And today what I want to do is show where that great word in the New Testament fits in, grace. But first, an illustration. Back in the 1970s, I went to my very first um, nightclub. It was called Blinkers. And it was right after the invention of electricity. Uh, and I went in and the, the lights were everywhere and it was quite amazing. And then about an hour into the evening, lights started appearing from everywhere. Even, even the fans in the ceiling had lights on them. And it was just amazing. I didn't know that that would happen. It was so much more than I expected. And grace is a little bit like that, not like a nightclub. It does a lot more than you could think. It does a lot more than you expect. If you've been around Christian circles for a while, you'll know that grace is unmerited favor. In other words, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And if we simply trust he did that, we come and ask forgiveness for our sins, that God accepts us based on what Jesus has done, not based on anything that we have done. We are, we are accepted and that's unmerited favor and that's what grace is. But that actually only tells us what grace is. It doesn't tell us what grace does. And that's a really important distinction and let me show you why that's such an important distinction. Supposing you could travel in time and you went back to the 17th century, got your great, 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 great grandfather or grandmother and brought them to your house by time travel or whatever. And they look out the window and they see a car in the driveway and they say, what's that? Because they've never seen one before. And you tell them it's a car. And now they know what it is. It's a car, but they have no idea what it does. He has no clue about the power of the car. If you were to tell him you can get to Galway in two hours using the car, he'd laugh at you. Galway in two hours isn't humanly possible. You see, he knows what the car is now, a car, but he has no clue as to its power and he has no clue as to the impact 
it can have in his life. So when you know what a car is, a car, and you don't know what it does, it can get you to Galway in two hours, you will actually never use it to get you to Galway. You will never really benefit from what it does. Now, we say that grace is unmerited favour, and that is what it is. But it doesn't tell us what it does. And you might say, Sean, you're wrong there. We know what grace does. We're saved by grace, Ephesians 2, and you're right, we are saved by grace. But what about after we're saved? What does grace do after we're saved? Does it do anything? And Hebrews 4.16 tells us, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So grace is unmerited favour, and what it does is it helps us in our time of need. So what that means is that grace is God acting in our life in our time of need. And with that understanding, Dallas Willard defines grace as God acting in our life to bring about and enable us to do what we cannot do on our own. God acting in our life to bring about and enable us to do what we cannot do on our own. So another word for grace actually could be power, the power of God acting in our lives. So grace is God's power at work in our lives. And 2 Corinthians gives us, uh, unpacks this even more, uh, where the way grace works in the lives of the followers of Jesus, where Paul is struggling, he's being tormented by a situation or a condition in his life, and God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So when he says, my grace is sufficient for you, he simply rephrases that. He, he explains that in a different way by saying his power is sufficient for Paul. So power and grace are actually interchangeable. And what God is saying to Paul in that situation is when you come to the end of what you can do, when you feel like you can't do anymore, my grace, my power kicks in to do what you can't do so that you can thrive in setbacks and in disappointments and in hardships. My grace is the power, God tells Paul, to help you to do that. So grace is God's power to help you to do what you can't. Grace is the power of God that enables you to live a life beyond human explanation. You could say grace is the fuel of life in the kingdom of God, actually the rocket fuel for life in the kingdom of God. So when Paul writes to you, as he does again and again and again, grace to you, he's really saying power to you. God's power to you to live a life that you could not live without God's power. Now, with that understanding of grace being the power of God in our lives, we can begin to make sense of some of the things that Jesus says about the kind of life his followers would have. So this is from Matthew chapter 5. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Even the unbelievers do that. So what Jesus is doing is he's pointing to a life of his followers, a life beyond human explanation, a life empowered by God's grace. In other words, God's power. Jesus isn't saying try harder than everyone else to be loving. He is saying that you will have a power in your life, at work in your life, that will enable you to do what you cannot do on your own, enable you to live a life beyond human explanation. So when Jesus says, don't worry, that's not humanly possible. It needs a power beyond what we have in and of ourselves. You see, people who aren't in the kingdom of God, who aren't born from above like we saw, they don't have that power. They don't have God's grace. They're still nice people. They love their family. They care about those around them. And you can do all that with 
in life without the grace of God. Unbelievers do that. But with a life filled with grace is a life filled with the power of God. Now that begs the question, does that mean all Christians are nicer, more loving than all non-Christians? Now, if you want the answer to that question, you'll have to do the growth groups when they start up again, the Mere Christianity Growth Group Part 2, because it'll answer it there. So the followers of Jesus live a life beyond human explanation because they have available to them the power of God, the power that is not human. And that's the whole deal for the whole of a life of the followers of, followers of Jesus. Like, let me tell you about my roles in life. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a neighbor, I'm a friend, I'm a member of Dublin Vineyard, I'm a pastor. In every one of those roles, I need God's grace. Not as a formula, not as a short prayer or a short blessing, but I need that grace, that power to be the husband, to be the father, to be the son, the brother, the friend, the church member, that I couldn't be in my own strength, to be the husband, the father, that, etc., that God's called me to be, beyond my best efforts. So Christians, in a sense, Christians need grace even more than non-Christians. Non-Christians just need grace to get saved. We need grace in every role of our lives, every day of our lives, to live the lives, our lives, beyond by the power of God. Dallas Willard says of Christians that we should burn up grace every day the way a rocket burns up rocket fuel at takeoff. We need grace every day, and it's available every day. 2 Corinthians 9 uh, verse 8 says, And God is able to make all grace or all power, his power, abound toward you. That you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound in every good work. So as a dad, as an employee, as, an, as a neighbor, to live a life beyond human explanation because God's power, God's grace is at work in you. Now, one of the problems with just knowing what grace is, in other words, being unmerited favor, is that it can lead to passivity on our part because we can kind of think, well, we can't earn it and there's nothing we can do to get it. Actually, there's nothing we should do because if we start thinking that there's something we should do, then that's beginning to get into works or earning and then we lose grace. But that actually is to misunderstand what grace is. Again, to quote Dallas Willard, he says, grace isn't opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Effort is all about action. Earning is about attitude. And this attitude of earning, God doesn't want to have anything to do with. We gave up the whole attitude of trying to earn something for God when we came to Jesus. So if you go back to the analogy of the car, we've talked about knowing the, what a car is and knowing what a car does, but we also have to know how to use the car. The car has the power to take you to Galway in two hours, but it won't happen unless you drive it. And grace is the power of God in your life, but you still have to do something, effort, to avail of the grace of God. So remember, grace is God acting in our life to enable us to do what we can't do in ourselves. But effort is needed to live in grace, just kind of like in the car with powered steering. The, the steering won't turn without us, but it really is the powered steering that's doing all the work. Like if you've ever driven a car that doesn't have powered steering, you know it's really hard work. But with powered steering, you can just use your finger to turn the wheel. The powered steering is doing all the work, but you still have to play your part. So that understanding helps us make sense of Peter's instructions in 2 Peter 3 verse 18 when he says, grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. That's actually something for us to do. We are to grow 
in his grace, grow in his power. So it's important for us to understand that by our actions and by our attitudes, we can actually increase the amount of grace of Jesus in our lives. And that is something that we have to intentionally undertake, something we have to intentionally learn as we go through life. So how do you do all that? What is the effort that we're supposed to do? And here it's really helpful to think about the people who were around Jesus. What did they do? Actually, they walked long distances just to be near him and hear him. And then when they were near him, they pressed in even closer, trying to touch him. The people around Jesus tried to simply be with him. That's what we're to do, to be with him. And when they were around him, they actually rearranged their life, their whole lives, to become his apprentices. Being with Jesus, learning to be like Jesus. And then how did they know that they were growing in their apprenticeship? Because increasingly, there would be, they would be overflowing with love, God's love, for others. A life beyond human explanation. You know what? The message of the gospel has never changed. In the Old Testament, God's people would be a people who live by God's power. In the New Testament, God's people would be a people who live by God's power. What the New Testament calls grace. Imagine being a person who lives by the power of God. Imagine being a neighbor, a student, a son, a daughter, a single person, a parent a work colleague who lives by the power of God. And here's the good news. Jesus is inviting all of us to learn how to live that type of life, to be the person he created us to be. Jesus is taking students, like we said at the start of the year, into his master class in life. And just as we end, What, just to think about, what have you been doing to get close to Jesus? How effective has it been? How would you know? These are really, really good questions to think about. Because as we saw in our previous series, engaging our mind and thinking about the truths of Scripture is so important. So I'm just going to pray for us as we end. Jesus, you never expected us to live apart from your power, apart from your grace. Lord, we know what it is. Now would you help us to live lives empowered by what it does? lives beyond human explanation. Amen.
Hello, I'm Lawrence, and I'm so glad to be with you today as we've come together online to celebrate communion. If you haven't got your bread and your wine ready, or your juice, then please do so now. You know, one of the most wonderful things that Jesus promises us is that no matter where you find yourself, He is with you right now and right where you are through the power of His Holy Spirit. So Lord Jesus, we welcome you. When we come together to take communion, we do that so that we can remember and reflect upon the importance of what it was that Jesus did on the cross for us, the costly price that he paid as he selflessly laid down his life for you and for me. His death on the cross brings us all forgiveness. And if we just believe in him, we get to enter into his new life and his kingdom. What a selfless act of love. Now, we all know that we depend upon food and drink for our everyday lives, our physical lives. But we really need to understand that we depend upon Jesus and what he has done on the cross for us, for our spiritual lives. Let's have a look at the scriptures and see how Paul described the Last Supper to the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also pass unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. So let's take a moment to quieten ourselves before the Lord, to reflect on what our salvation has cost him, and to examine our own hearts. The Holy Spirit may highlight some things that you might need to lay down before him. So I want to invite you to take a few seconds to do that now. Lord, if there is unforgiveness in my heart, I lay it down before you now. Lord, if there is unconfessed sin in my heart, I give that to you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. So now, with thanksgiving in our hearts, we get to participate in the Last Supper with Jesus as we take his communion. His body broken for you. And his blood shed for you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the life that you bring.
Jesus, you are enough. That's why we've decided to follow you. Help us to trust you in everything we'll do today and this week. Amen. So we've come to the end of our time together. We're so glad you joined us. Uh, if you've any kind of questions for us or prayer requests, please do contact us by email at office at dublinvineyard.ie or you can also visit our website dublinvineyard.ie. Can I also invite you to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and subscribe on YouTube. Once again, thank you so much for making the time to be with us today and join us next Sunday at 10.30 in the morning or 8 in the evening. See you then.